years waiting for 45 affordable housing openings. Many seniors are already struggling to make ends meet, relying on retirement funds or Medicaid funding to cover living, medical, and housing expenses. Our seniors should not face even more barriers to afford a roof over their head. While DIFTA, Department for the Aging, does not lead the construction of senior housing, it does provide programs to help seniors afford their housing needs. One example is this home sharing program, operated through a partnership with the New York Foundation for Senior Citizens, which pairs seniors with other older adults and younger adults, matching seniors with roommates, help with the rent and combat social isolation. Additionally, in partnership with the Civil Court of the City of New York, DIFTA operates the Assigned Council Project for individual age 60 and older. This program provides eligible older adults with a social worker and lawyers who assist them with their housing court cases and unlawful evictions. In addition to testimony from DIFTA and HPD, the committee will be hearing intro number six, sponsored by Council Member Barron, which require the city to give senior tenants information about legal assistance before eviction, and intro number 225, sponsored by Council Member Brannon, which requires the installation of protect, uh, protective devices such as grab bars and threats um, in the bathrooms that help enhance mobility, safety, and the quality of life for seniors and persons with disabilities in multiple dwellings. Our question today is what is the city proactively doing to meet the challenge before us? And what can we do better? We look forward to learning more about DIFTA's program that supports seniors with securing and maintaining affordable housing, an HPD program that expands senior affordable housing and supports seniors' ability to age in place. In order to strengthen our efforts to help every New Yorker age in the communities they help to build, it is imperative that this work is tackled together. Interagency coordination is a critical piece of this puzzle. I'd like to thank the committee staff for their help in putting together this hearing. Our council, Nusak Chidori, uh, policy analyst, Kalima Johnson, finance analyst, Daniel Krupp, and finance unit head, Dohina Sapura, and also my deputy chief of staff, Marin Guerra. And I'd like to thank uh, the member of the committees who have joined us today. We have Councilmember Rose, Councilmember Credencek, Councilmember Cabrera, Councilmember Perkins, Councilmember Rosenthal's, and Councilmember Lewis. Did I get it right? Everybody? So now we are going to have our council swearing the, uh, uh, the mayor's uh, panel. Please raise your right hand. Right hand. Sorry, right hand. Thank you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Yes. Yes. You may begin. Good morning, Chair. Uh, Chen, Council Member uh, Cornegy, Chair Cornegy, and members of the committees. My name is Kim Darga, Associate Commissioner for Preservation at the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. I am joined by my colleague Emily Lehman, Assistant Commissioner for Special Needs Housing at HPD, to discuss HPD's work supporting seniors in new construction. Thank you for the opportunity to highlight the multifaceted efforts HPD has implemented in addition to the many services provided by our sister agencies to support New York's senior citizens by building and preserving historic numbers of affordable housing, protecting tenants from harassment, and using innovative tools to expand our efforts to those who need it the most. It is no secret that the city is facing a housing crisis. Since Mayor de Blasio launched 
the Housing New York Plan in 2014, New York City has accelerated the construction and preservation of affordable housing to levels not seen in 30 years. HPD is now positioned to speed up and expand the plan to build or preserve an additional 100,000 units for a total of 300,000 homes by 2026. As a result, five years into the plan, we have established a new baseline for how affordable housing can and should be built in New York City. Already, this administration has financed over 135,000 affordable apartments through fiscal year 2019, 57,000 of which serve very low income individuals making less than roughly $37,000 a year or 48,000 for a family of three. This housing is available to all New Yorkers, including but not limited to the seniors that built the city and would like to remain here. As part of Housing New York, the administration committed to create or preserve 15,000 senior homes and apartments. Through the new expanded Housing New York 2.0, we are now committed to serve a total of 30,000 senior households residing in affordable apartments. To meet this additional commitment, we launched Seniors First in October 2017, a three-pronged strategy to build, better serve the housing needs of older New Yorkers on fixed incomes. First, make more homes accessible to seniors and people with disabilities. Second, build new 100% affordable senior developments on underserved NYCHA land and other public and private sites. And third, preserve existing senior developments. These initiatives will increase the number of affordable senior housing units within the city, as well as improve the ability of seniors who live in affordable housing today to age comfortably and safely in their current homes. Simple changes can make staying in one's home a viable, safer option and create a more accessible city for all New Yorkers. Making it possible for more seniors to stay in the homes they live in is an important anti-displacement tool as we work towards protecting our more vulnerable residents. HPD is using a wide range of measures, from the physical to the financial, to ensure that seniors can stay in their homes and communities as they age, and to create inclusive neighborhoods for seniors and people with disabilities. HPD-funded rehabilitation projects are now required to include accessibility improvements identified through an enhanced building physical needs assessment. This holistic review not only identifies basic uh, building system needs, like a roof or heating system, but also building-wide improvements to help seniors age safely in their homes. In exchange for HPD funds, we require regulatory protections or a longer regulatory term uh, for existing protections to ensure that rents remain affordable for existing residents. In addition to this building-wide assessment, HPD's Aging in Place initiative offers existing senior residents modifications within their homes to help these as a residents live more comfortably and reduce the risk of falls. Our new Home Fix program assists low and moderate income homeowners in one to four family properties fund home repairs by providing favorable financing for low income and senior households. Further, HPD continues to work with our partners in the city to increase enrollment in SCREE, which freezes the rent for seniors living in rent-regulated apartments. This helps ensure that more of our seniors living in rent-regulated apartments can stay in their homes and the city they love without fear of being displaced by escalating rents. Finally, the de Blasio administration has made protecting tenants from harassment a core part of its strategy to confront the affordable housing crisis. This administration has worked in partnership with the city council and various branches of government to tackle the issue with a comprehensive, multi-pronged approach. As a city, we are focused on keeping people in their homes and neighborhoods by successfully advocating with many members of the council to close loopholes and rent regulation laws at the state level, creating and preserving historic numbers of affordable housing, empowering tenants with more resources, aggressively enforcing city codes, and utilizing all of our partnerships to create data-driven, innovative tools targeted at stopping harassment before it starts. We therefore understand the intent of the bills being heard today, but want to continue conversations with the council to make sure we are getting at the same goals to protect seniors in a targeted and appropriate manner. Good morning, my name is Emily Lehman, and I would like to speak to the additional efforts HPD is undertaking to bring new affordable housing units to a variety of populations, 
including seniors. Over the course of the plan, HPD has financed nearly 44,000 new apartments for all New Yorkers, including seniors. HPD is explicitly committed to supporting the city's seniors in our affordable housing portfolio. Since the start of the HNY plan in 2014, HPD has financed over 8,500 affordable senior apartments through over a dozen different housing programs. This work provides critical relief to a population of city residents who are projected to increase over the next two decades. One important tool that we use to add to our affordable senior housing stock is our Senior Affordable Rental Apartments, SARA program. SARA provides gap financing in the for form of low interest loans to support the construction and renovation of affordable housing for seniors 62 and older with low incomes. Through September 2019, we have funded approximately 3,000 new affordable senior units through this program. Our new construction, construction term sheets for HPD financial assistance also encourage intergenerational housing. We are now seeing projects benefit as a result of the Zoning for Quality and Affordability ZQA amendment, which makes it easier and less expensive to create quality affordable senior housing. The passage of Zoning for Quality and Affordability by the Council a key tool to modernize zoning rules also enabled the creation of the privately financed affordable senior housing program, which incentivizes the creation of new affordable senior units. And in addition to providing subsidy through SARA and other HPD financing programs, the city has also committed significant numbers of public sites for the development of new affordable senior housing. None of this work would be possible without the strong support provided to senior housing needs by our many partners and allies. HPD is excited to build on previous successful collaborations with the Department for the Aging through our expanded focus on seniors, and we are grateful for the information and assistance they have offered on our new tool to help seniors in our portfolio age in place. HPD was part of the advisory committee for DIFTA's Aging in Place Guide for Building Owners and believes it is a tremendous resource for private landlords who are interested in making changes to their buildings to enable their residents to continue to live in their homes as they age and their needs shift. It is one of the aging in place guides that we often reference to develop our seniors first initiative. We also work with them closely when senior centers are in HPD projects and in a variety of other ways to support this important population. The city council has also played an invaluable role in improving access for senior housing. I especially want to thank Chair Chin as well as Chair Carnegie and Speaker Johnson for their strong leadership in this critical area to serve some of the city's residents in the most need. We are encouraged by the progress we have been able to achieve over the last six years through Housing New York and are excited to see the results of our strong commitments going forward. Thank you for your time and I am happy to answer any questions. Good morning, committee chairs, Chin and Carnegie, and members of the Aging, Housing and Building Committees. I'm Jocelyn Grodin, Associate Commissioner for the Bureau of Social Services and Direct Services at the New York City Department for the Aging. I'm joined today by my colleagues from the New York City Commission on Human Rights and the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation and Development. I would like to thank you for this important opportunity to discuss DIFTA and the city's commitment to ensuring the dignity and quality of life of diverse older New Yorkers throughout the boroughs. As older adults continue to represent the fastest growing segment of New York City's population, with nearly 1.73 million people aged 60 and older, it is estimated that by 2030, with the booming of the older population, one in five New Yorkers will be aged 60 and older. It is for this very reason that it is critical that we provide older New Yorkers with the proper tools and resources they need to thrive, both financially and socially, and allow them to stay safely in their homes. DIFTA's priority is to provide the services and resources older adults need to remain in their home. This includes a variety of in-home services based on individualized need that include things like case management, home care, home delivered meals, friendly visiting, social supports, and community services like geriatric mental health funded through Thrive New York City, senior centers, senior employment, caregiver support programs, elder abuse and crime victim intervention services, 
and volunteer programs that work to meet the individual needs of older adults. Some of the programs I would like to highlight as part of today's important discussion include naturally occurring retirement communities, home sharing, um, which was brought up earlier, and the assigned council project, a minor home repair. I'll start with NORCS. We are very proud of the naturally occurring retirement community, often referred to as NORCS. The term refers to a residential location that is not age restricted or built specifically for older adults, but that over time has a significant concentration of older residents. Think of it as a perfect mix of aging in place while giving older adults everything they need in an intergenerational setting to age well. The goal of the NORC is to provide services that meet the self-identified need of older adults of a particular community so they remain independent and age in place. A NORC emerges from the community empowerment and activism between older residents, aging service providers, and community stakeholders. NORCs push in services so that people can remain in place. Many NORCs provide case assistance, health care management, health promotion, recreation, and other needed services, such as transportation, escort, telephone reassurance, friendly visiting, and sometimes things like light housekeeping. NORCs promote community building, help combat social isolation, and promote independence. The Duarte Foundation for Senior Citizens Home Sharing Program seeks to match persons for whom shared living arrangements would benefit financially and help to promote their well-being and potentially reduce things like social isolation. The program is open to adults age 18 and older, and only one um, participant in the match needs to be age 60 and older. Hosts own or rent apartments or houses in one of New York City's five boroughs and, and must be open to sharing part of their dwelling with at least one other compatible person. Through the proprietary quick match system and a staff of professional licensed social workers, the New York Foundation for Senior Citizens determines the most compatible share mates by evaluating 31 unique lifestyle objectives. In recent months, the Department for the Aging has taken significant steps to redevelop the home sharing program, focusing on more robust communication, outreach, and partnership strategies. Understanding that this is a program that requires a targeted approach, home sharing offers affordable housing and provides both social and financial benefits. The Assigned Council Project is a joint effort between DIPTA and the Office of Civil Justice of the Human Resource Administration, Department of Social Services. Our program provides New Yorkers who are age 60 and older, who are faced with eviction proceedings, legal and social service support, including legal representation that allows them to stay in their homes. Community-based legal service providers contracted by OCJ provide full legal representation to ACP clients in coordination with social workers that are provided by the Department for the Aging's Assigned Council Project. The overall goal is to prevent the eviction of the older adult. But beyond that, ACP has an opportunity and works with older adults to meet their holistic social service needs. Key services provided by DIFTA ACP are the preparation and submission of SCRI initial and appeal applications, as well as rental assistant grant loan applications to cover rent arrears. Utilizing internal resources along with the resources of our critical partner organizations, our direct service staff are able to maximize engagement, assessment, data collection, advocacy, service referrals, and provisions of concrete services as a means to stop the downward spiral. Referrals to senior centers, case management agencies, and numerous community-based organizations also help address the specific needs of the older adult. DIPTA's housing specialists advise older adults on financial matters and entitlements. 
along with their rights as tenants. Their work includes referrals to rent assistance programs, as well as shared living arrangements, Section 202 housing, market rate senior residences with services, and affordable housing services designed for the general public. DIFTA's minor home repair program is small, but it's an essential component in DIFTA's broad portfolio aimed at assisting older adults. Through this program, senior owners of private homes, condos, co-ops, and even renters with consent and after multiple attempts sometimes to enlist their landlord are benefiting from free home maintenance and repair services. In conclusion, each New York each of New Yorkers' older adults deserves and requires our resources and support so they can live and thrive in the communities they built, raised their families on, and called home for much of their lives, sometimes all of their lives. DIFTA supports the intent of these bills and welcomes the opportunity for further discussion and collaboration to ensure that all aspects of the bills have been explored. We shall continue to build and strengthen our partnerships with our sister city agencies, always bringing the aging lens into every conversation. As advocates for older adults, we are mindful that our priority is to keep older adults in their home, independent, healthy, happy. The best way for us to do this is to ensure that older adults are always represented and that we continually strengthen the relationships that we have built with our sister agencies, nonprofits, the council. It is imperative that we continue to build on the successes that we've seen and set proper precedent for how we want older New Yorkers to be treated. The council has been a continuous ally in ensuring that older adults have dignified quality of life, and we look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Good morning, committee chairs Chin and Cornegie, and members of the Aging and Housing and Buildings Committees. I'm Zoe Chenitz, Senior Policy Counsel at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Thank you for convening today's hearing. Before turning to intros 225 and 6, I'll highlight some of the Commission's recent work. The Commission is the local civil rights enforcement agency that enforces the New York City Human Rights Law, one of the broadest and most protective anti-discrimination and anti-harassment laws in the country, now totaling 20, 26 protected categories across nearly all aspects of city living, housing, employment, and public accommodations, in addition to discriminatory harassment and bias-based profiling by law enforcement. By statute, the Commission has two main functions. First, the Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau enforces the city human rights law by investigating complaints of discrimination from the public, initiating its own investigations on behalf of the city, and utilizing its in-house testing program to identify entities breaking the law. Second, through the Community Relations Bureau, which is comprised of community service centers in each of the city's five boroughs, the Commission provides free workshops on individuals' rights and businesses, employers and housing providers' obligations under the city human rights law, and creates engaging programming on human rights and civil rights-related issues. Over the past four and a half years since Commissioner Carmelin P. Malalas took the helm of the agency, the Commission has implemented 28 changes to the city human rights law including seven new substantive areas of protection and other statutory expansions of the agency's mandate and scope. At the same time, the Commission is increasingly becoming the preferred ven venue for victims of discrimination. In fiscal year 2019, the Commission fielded nearly 10,000 inquiries from members of the public via calls, emails, and in-person intakes, the highest in the Commission's history, resulting in 785 complaints filed and 396 pre-complaint interventions. Also in fiscal year uh, 2019, the agency obtained over 5.3 million in damages for complainants and nearly $800,000 in, in civil penalties for a combined total of over $6 million, the highest in the commission's history and over five times the amount of damages and penalties recovered in 2014, the year prior to the start of Commissioner Malalas's tenure. In fiscal years 2018 and 2019, 
the Commission awarded approximately $1.2 million in damages to complainants and over $300,000 in civil penalties in housing cases related to disability. Disability rights and access is one of the Commission's core priorities. In fact, a program within the Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau called Project Equal Access works directly with landlords and other housing providers to ensure that residents with disabilities can obtain accommodations in their homes and buildings without ever having to file a complaint or go through an investigation and litigation. Of course, if landlords are unwilling to make reasonable accommodations, a complaint is filed with the Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau and the case proceeds through investigation and possibly litigation. The Commission's Project Equal Access was able to achieve accommodations in 139 matters in fiscal year 2019, up significantly from the prior year. With respect to filed complaints, claims on the basis of disability consistently represent one of the most common types of complaints filed at the agency across all areas of jurisdiction. The city human rights law guarantees the right to accommodations for people with disabilities unless providing such an accommodation would pose an undue hardship. Disability is broadly defined under our law to include any physical, medical, mental, or psychological impairment as set forth in the law. This broad definition reaches most, if not all, of the disabilities or conditions that people may develop as they age, meaning that older New Yorkers who require reasonable accommodations to fully and safely enjoy the use of their homes have a right to request them from their housing providers under the disability protections of the city human rights law. The cost of reasonable accommodations is borne by the housing provider. A case resolved earlier this year demonstrates the strength of the city human rights law's protections and the Commission's commitment to creating meaningful and wide-ranging change. The Law Enforcement Bureau resolved a case involving housing provider River Park Residences, LP, in which a tenant alleged that River Park failed to reasonably accommodate his use of a wheelchair by refusing his repeated requests over several years to widen a bathroom door and install a roll-in shower in his apartment and to make the building's entrance accessible. After the Law Enforcement Bureau investigated and issued a probable cause determination, the parties entered into a conciliation agreement requiring that River Park revise its anti-discrimination policies, create a website, the first of its kind as part of a conciliation agreement with the Commission, that is specifically designed to be accessible to individuals with disabilities and includes information about requesting reasonable accommodations conduct anti-discrimination training for all employees, display the commission's postings, and pay complainant $160,000 in emotional distress damages, the highest emotional distress damages award to date in a housing action. As further relief negotiated under the settlement, River Park has installed automated entrance and mailbox and mailroom doors throughout the four buildings of River Park Towers to make the entire housing complex physically accessible. In a decision and order issued by Commissioner Malalas in 2017 following a trial at Oath, the Commission awarded $45,000 in emotional distress damages to a child and $50,000 to the child's mother, in addition to a $60,000 civil penalty where a landlord refused for three years to provide a bathtub necessary for a child with a disability. The landlord also engaged in a campaign of harassment against the child and her mother by making false complaints to the police and the fire department and by filing an unwarranted eviction proceeding against them. The $60,000 penalty could have been reduced to $10,000 if the respondent had made the ordered reasonable accommodation within a certain period of time after the decision. Following an appeal, the Supreme Court upheld the Commission's decision in full, and because respondent failed to make the required reasonable accommodation on time, imposed the full civil penalty. Respondent was also ordered to undergo training and to post a notice of rights at the building. Intro 225 would require the installation of multiple dwelling, in multiple dwellings of devices such as grab bars and shower treads for seniors and people with disabilities. The bill would allow eligible owners to seek a tax abatement for certain related installations. We support the intent of the bill to ensure that people with disabilities, including older New Yorkers, are able to safely use their bathroom and remain in their homes. However, the Commission has some concerns that Intro 225 could undermine existing disability protections under the City Human Rights Law that already require the provision of these types of accommodations. We are continuing to review the bill and look forward to working with Council to identify the best approach to meeting the policy objectives outlined in the bill. 
Insure 6 would require that the owner of a dwelling unit ser serves a person who is 62 or older with a petition or notice to evict. Uh, the owner must also notify HPD of the resident's name, address, and phone number so that HPD may then notify the person of available legal services. Violations are punishable by a Class A misdemeanor. The bill also requires the Commission and HPD to analyze the information received from housing providers concerning senior evictions and issue a public report identifying any trends in senior evictions and any findings or patterns of discrimination in senior evictions. Again, the Commission supports the intent of the bill to help older New Yorkers age in place, particularly in affordable housing. The Commission is also committed to working to identify and root out discriminatory patterns and practices in housing across all areas of protected status, including age. We look forward to working with Council to ensure that the appropriate pr approach is taken to ensure that older New Yorkers are able to keep and enjoy their homes free from discrimination. We appreciate the Council's attention to the critical issue to these critical issues and will continue to work with you in partnership to ensure that older New Yorkers and people with disabilities can safely enjoy and remain in their homes surrounded by family and community. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'm going to take this opportunity um, just to read my opening statement. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Robert Cornegie, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings, and I want to thank Council Member Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging, for holding this joint oversight hearing on senior affordable housing. We're joined by fellow Council Members who've already been read off, All right. but we've been joined by Council Member Barron. Um, today we'll hear testimony, we've heard testimony from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development and the Department of Aging about the city's efforts to maintain and increase the availability of affordable, accessible housing for the city's senior population, as well as from interested members of the public. We will also have a chance to learn more about the administration's plans to improve senior housing through the seniors' first component of its Housing New York plan. There's no question that the nation's senior population is growing, and New York City is no exception. As my co-chair noted, the city is home to nearly 1.6 million individuals over the age of 60, or 18.6% of the total population. That number is only projected to grow, and while the number of older adults continues to rise, it is unclear whether the city's efforts to meet their housing needs has risen accordingly. Senior housing that is affordable, safe, and supportive is essential to allowing older adults to age with dignity and security. Making more affordable and accessible housing available to seniors would go a long way in reducing the number of seniors who enter the shelter system or wind up moving to long-term care facilities, and could also mitigate any decline in quality of life that comes with making such a move. This is an important issue that is especially important to me as my district is home to a sizable senior community and has been designated as a naturally occurring retirement community, otherwise known as a NORC. Today we'll hear from the administration, or we've heard from the administration about the efforts it has taken to improve the availability of affordable housing for seniors, both, both through preserving existing housing <clears throat> and through creating new ones. We will explore the city's changing demographics, the current housing market, and current and anticipated efforts to ensure city housing stock is available to meet the needs of growing senior population. HPD is tasked with developing and preserving affordable housing in the city, and we look forward to hearing about the measures it has taken and continues to take to specifically meet the needs of seniors, whether through the administration's Seniors First program or HPD's aging in place efforts. We'll also hear two pieces of legislation related to improving housing for the city's older population. First, intro number six, sponsored by Council Member Barron, would require property owners to disclose certain information to the city before evicting tenants who are seniors, and require the city to provide information to those tenants about legal assistance that may be available to them. Second, intro number 225, sponsored by Council Member Brannon, will require the installation of certain protective devices, including bathroom grab bars and treads in homes of seniors and persons with disabilities to improve safety and mobility. I want to thank the advocates attending today's hearing. I look forward to collaborating further as we work to improve the quality of life of this, seniors older, of this city's older adults. We'll now hear remarks from Council Member Barron, sponsor of intro number six. Uh, thank you to the chairs for holding this hearing, to the public for coming to participate, and to those on the panel who are sharing the information. This bill, as has been said, would require HPD to provide tenants 
uh, who are 62 years of age and older with information about the legal services that are available to them and it would require the landlord to notify HPD so that we can act and give assistance to those persons who are in such condition before they would be uh, evicted. It would also require, as has been said, the commissioner to report to the mayor and to the speaker of any patterns of discrimination against tenants, particularly those who are in that senior category. And just to give you a little bit of history, this bill was introduced um, 13 years ago, in 2006, by my predecessor, my husband, who is now Assembly Member Charles Barron. And it was based on an eviction case that occurred in Harlem. Uh, the tenant was Ms. Florence Rice. That's why we are calling this the Florence Rice Bill. And she was facing eviction from her apartment in Harlem. And it was particularly uh, notary because there's been a particular push against seniors, many of whom live alone and who don't have family and who don't have the ability to perhaps even get to all the mail that they're inundated with to be aware of the crisis that they may be facing. And by uh, more than 20% of older adults live in poverty. More than 20% of our seniors live in poverty. And many of them are rent burdened and do not qualify for public benefits. And it's projected that by 2030, 20% of the population will be 60 or older. And while the city is doing a great job to make sure that we expand the housing opportunities and address the issues that seniors face in terms of finding affordable housing, we've got to make sure that we have um, a city agency in place a city agency plan in place that will provide protection for seniors, specifically to help them remain in their homes once they have uh, gotten adequate housing and to protect them from those unscrupulous persons and plans that try to evict them. Um, so I just want to again thank the chairs and look forward. Glad to know that you support the intent. That means we have a common starting position and to move forward so that we can make this bill a reality. Thank you. So I'm going to open up. Oh, I forgot. I just want to recognize, uh, of course, my husband. He was the first one that introduced the bill, as well as my staff, my chief of staff, Joy Simmons, and my legislative director, Indigo Washington. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. We're going to open with a few questions from the chairs and then move directly to questions from uh, my colleagues. Thank you. Uh, we also been joined by Councilmember Deutsch. Um, thank you for your testimony. Um, I have a couple of questions uh, to start with uh, HPD. Um, I know that in your testimony, uh, you talked about the uh, the Sarah program, the Senior Affordable Rental uh, Apartment Program. And then you talked about um, how many uh, units were funded, 3,000 new affordable units uh, were funded through September 2019. When did this program start? Uh, so we rolled out the Sarah program for the first time under Housing New York. Uh, the term sheet was first posted in late 2014. So it's between 2014 to 2019 that the program has um, funded about 3,000 units? Correct. Uh, so the SARA program, I would like to point out, is only one of many programs through which we can develop senior housing. So uh, while, we've, while the SARA program is the primary way we've developed new senior housing, um, in total we've developed about 3,800 new senior units. Um, in total, our our total production of senior housing, new construction, and preservation is 8,500 units, and we have done that uh, through, through over 12 dozen programs. But a lot of it is through preservation. So of the so 80, those are not new units. The new units are only 3,800. Correct. So how do we, uh, how is the administration really focusing on um, developing more because of such a critical need yeah. and relating to that is I know there was a lot of excitement around uh, when we were doing the the mandatory inclusionary zoning and the whole ZQA uh, zoning for quality and affordable um, housing and there were a lot of discussions about developing senior housing on these like parking lots 
that are next to senior buildings because they're not being utilized. Do you have any statistic? Are, were any senior building built uh, on some of these senior housing parking lots since the uh, CQA was uh, passed? I thank you, Council Member. Those are great questions. So first, I would just like to take a step back. Um, HPD has financed over 135,000 units under the housing plan to date. And while 8,500 of those have been specifically for seniors, uh, seniors are eligible to apply to any of the units that we've financed. Um, in terms of producing more units specifically for seniors, so we have uh, the SARA program uh, under which we've financed approximately 3,000 units. Um, through the passage of ZQA um, and the creation of the air of heirs, we have been able to finance uh, senior, new senior units in other programs, in other loan programs um, that HPD finances. Um, and then specifically, um, building new senior housing on parking lots and other underutilized land is something we have also uh, been able to do. Um, we refer to that initiative as Housing Plus. Um, and one example of a, a project, of a Housing Plus project that we've developed um, is Trace Puentes up in the Bronx. It is 175 new units of senior housing um, on a senior, on a, an existing 202 campus uh, that opened at the end of 2018. And also, uh, I know a lot of the housing has been developed on city-owned sites. Yes. Are, are we successful in doing any on private sites? Yes. So. Uh, Specifically with the SARA program, we have developed um, a mix of public sites and private sites. Um, just within the public, the list of public sites, we have 24 sites that we are either they're either in construction, pre-development, or um, upcoming RFPs specifically to develop senior housing on. And then we have a very robust pipeline of private sites as well. Can you share that with us? Um, the list of sites. Yes. Um, I, I'm happy to follow up with the list. Yes, um, please do. Um, the other question that I have is that I know that we have, um, you know, new senior housing that are built, uh, but a lot of them don't have uh, a social service component. I know we have, you know, DIFTA here. Uh, so yes, we have a new senior building, but there's a lack of supportive services because they're not supportive housing. And another um, issue that came to our attention from constituents is also that some of the new senior buildings that are built or some of the existing senior buildings don't have on-site security, um, you know, 24-7. And that is a concern. So going forward, how do we make sure that when we do new senior housing and do preservation, that we do include uh, social service component um, in there and also, um, you know, security um, to make sure that the seniors will be, you know, safe and, and get the, the services they need where they live. Uh, thank you, yes, also very good questions. Um, and we do recognize how valuable having these services on site in our senior buildings are to, to the residents. Um, in regard to services, um, any new project that HPD is funding through the SARA program, we now do require on-site services. There are a few different funding options for services available. Um, HRA has an RFP for senior services, um, specifically for SARA buildings. Um, in addition, um, a developer could elect to include a supportive housing component in their senior building. Um, so we'd be providing supportive housing specifically for seniors um, and the service funding such as NYC 1515 um, would be available in that building. Um, and then second, in regards to security, um, although it is not a requirement that security be provided, we do find that almost all of our new construction senior buildings uh, have been including uh, some level of security. Yeah, but not all. So that is something that I think HPD really need to kind of work with the developer on to make sure that we have um, those programs. So you're talking about 8,500 units out of 135,000. That's only 6% of the housing. But the senior population is, uh, is growing and right now is at least 18% of the city. So 
how are we going to be catching up to make sure that we meet the needs? So maybe it's worth uh, talking about recent changes that uh, we have made. Uh, the original uh, housing plan that we launched uh, early in the administration uh, made a commitment to uh, create, produce, preserve 15,000 units of senior housing. And we have, um, in late 2017, as part of Housing New York 2.0, we doubled that commitment. So in the um, last couple years, we have been uh, ramping up our programs and initiatives that specifically can serve seniors. Um, I think it's worth noting uh, something that uh, Assistant Commissioner Lehman mentioned earlier, which is that um, in addition to the senior-specific initiatives that we have, um, Housing New York 2.0 increased the commitment overall to producing affordable housing and preserving affordable housing in the city, and that that affordable housing is also available to seniors. Um, as part of Housing New York 2.0, um, the, the three-pronged approach, right, preserve existing senior housing to the maximum extent possible, um, creating new affordable senior opportunities through programs like SARA, and to also help meet seniors where they live today through our Aging in Place initiative. Um, all of those initiatives are now up and running, so we do expect that um, we will be able to increase production across the board. That's good. Uh, I just wanted to welcome uh, students from the Long Island City High School sitting on the balcony. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Taking a civic lesson. How do we help our seniors get more affordable housing and to be able to, <laughs> right? All your grandparents. <laughs> um, okay. So I uh, wanted to pass it back on to the chair. I have some other questions, but let's get other uh, colleagues. In. So I just have a couple of quick, quick questions before I defer to uh, my colleagues for questioning because I know they have other places to be. Um, I have an overarching kind of contextual question so we can kind of frame what we're doing here today. Um, I had the pleasure of literally right before I got elected serving um, on central staff uh, as a policy analyst on aging and veterans and got familiar, familiarized myself very much with uh, the age friendly New York and aging improvement districts. Now that was under a former administration, I'm wondering um, has this current administration adopted the policies that were associated with age-friendly New York? Uh, and if so, where are we? Sure, so as you probably know, uh, the age-friendly uh, New York Initiative Bank began in 2009. Um, and in 2017, the city updated the age-friendly plan with new goals and commitments to better serve New York City seniors, uh, two which folks focused on HPD-specific recommendations. Uh, one is to support affordable senior housing, uh, as, in, as I mentioned, um, it actually in 2017 as well, as part of Housing New York 2.0, we um, expanded what we had already been doing uh, through uh, our commitment to new affordable housing through the SARA program, as well as expanding uh, our outreach and work around preserving existing uh, senior developments in New York City, including the 202s. Um, and then the other uh, part of that uh, commitment was to broaden access to affordable housing for LGBT seniors. Um, and we have um, actually done that as well, uh, in part through uh, work that we've done through uh, new construction and uh, the Saris program specifically. Uh, also, I'd like to say that my district most recently was um was awarded the designation of having a, a, a NORC, um, a ver vertical NORC actually, because we have a great deal of home ownership um, that we're trying to preserve for our seniors. And we absolutely look forward to, I wanna, I wanna thank my co-chair um, for after uh, some persistent uh, <laughs> uh, advocacy um, from, from me, her, her absolutely helping walk through that process. Uh, and so we look forward to in the upcoming months actually um, seeing that program come to, to fruition in uh, Bed-Stuy and Northern Crown Heights. Um, I wondered if you had a breakdown by district of affordable housing units for seniors, for members. Um, I do not have a breakdown by district today, but certainly we can follow up with you. I do have uh, you know, information by borough if that is useful. 
Yeah, so I don't know if you disseminate that information th uh, by precinct or, or by, by literal council district, uh, but that's something I'd like to discuss with you and find out how you do it and, and whether it actually is conducive for members to have a thorough assessment of what's in there under their purview. Sure, I think we're all happy to follow up on that. Okay, so how many affordable housing units with support services are available versus overall units? That's an interesting question. Um, I don't think we have exact breakdown of uh, units that have supportive components to them or additional support services within the affordable housing portfolio. I can say that through both, um, as Assistant Commissioner Lehman mentioned earlier, through our um, new senior development in the SARA program, we do incorporate seniors, uh, service, uh, sorry, services for seniors. Um, there is also some support for seniors within the um, HUD 202 developments. We actually found there's some inconsistency there and we've looked to, um, we're at currently actually evaluating what we can do to create a more consistent level of services when we are financing the 202s. Not every 202 in New York City is actually also has in, uh, in uh, support from the city. Uh, but when they are, we're doing outreach to them and as uh, they are coming to us for financial assistance, uh, we are looking for how we can help. I think it's particularly um, right now, given the change in the federal guidance um, coming from HUD on uh, allowing the, a portion of the 202 properties to take advantage of the RAD program, um, we are trying to figure out how to support those properties and how to ensure that um, the right type of support is there for the residents. So, so obviously, um, like my co-chair mentioned, um, uh, having seniors age in place and have it be sustainable is critical and services associated with supporting that. Um, so I don't know whether there's a blanket system we could create because I think that there are some seniors in my district in particular that are falling through the cracks. So they meet an income requirement that doesn't allow them to have support services on site at least uh, and are challenged in finding those services. We, f we see that in our office quite, f quite frequently. So I'd definitely like to revisit with my co-chair okay. the, the potential for more support services to be available even when seniors in are financially program. stable. Uh, more support services for sustainable care, you know, the ability to stay in there. Sure. Homes. And then my last question would, uh, is a follow-up question to my co-chair around security and whether or not any of the security that we're talking about uh, on-site for seniors is biometric and is there a movement for, because there's, there's a movement for biometric security in low-income buildings in the city, which I'm, which I'm studying extensively mm -hmm. uh, uh, to see what, you know, potential disproportionate negative impact it's going to have on minority communities. Um, I'm wondering if we have the same thing running synonymously for seniors in terms of biometric security. I think we would have to get back to you on that. Okay, I, I wish you would because okay. I, what, what we found in minority communities is that its implementation has caused tremendous barriers. I'd hate to think that while we're doing and trying to deal and unravel that, it's happening for seniors as well, and then we'll have to go in and try to unravel that. So to the extent that we can look at it up front and see if it's actually um, a service and or amenity that meets the needs of seniors before it's implemented, we should probably have that discussion based on what I'm finding um, with buildings and minority communities, communities attempting to use biometrics as a form of security. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions from... Oh, we've been joined by Council Member Espinal. Okay. Uh, we have questions from uh, Council Member Barron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, once again, glad that you support the intent of Intro 6. And just want to know how do you envision what input or suggestions can you give to us in shaping this bill to make sure that it moves forward expeditiously and uh, is a document that both sides can agree is worthy. What suggestions can you give to us in terms of creating the list of seniors? How do we generate that list? How can we make sure that people don't fall through the crack? We understand that there are all kinds of privacy issues that we have to make sure we don't violate. But what suggestions can you offer to us in terms of generating that list of persons who would qualify? 
So maybe I'll make an initial attempt and then my colleagues can, um, can join in as well. So we absolutely, as you said, support the, um, the intent of the bill, um, HPD and um, uh, absolutely the other uh, agencies represented here care greatly about um, supporting seniors and also minimizing tenant evictions. And we've done a lot, uh, specifically the administration has done a lot to combat tenant harassment. Um, and I think we're open to, you know, co continuing the conversations with you. Um, I think there, we are going to have to address the privacy concerns that you've mentioned. Um, and I don't know if my colleagues want to add to that today, but I think it would be worth um, following up with you specifically about that. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to um, to add on to what my uh, colleague at HPD was able to share. So I, I think um, you, you've really hit on the, the core of, of um, what our question might be as we continue to look at, at the bill and think about the best path forward. Um, so from, I think from the commission's perspective, um, we're often cautious about um, contexts where housing providers might be making inquiries about um, different areas of protected status, but age, age would certainly be one. Um, and I think as, as the bill's currently drafted, it does contemplate that um, housing providers would, would need to know uh, the ages of, of their residents in order to be able to report subsequently to HPD when um, an eviction might be, um, be underway or being contemplated. Um, so we, we, what we would want to think through, uh, are there any unintended adverse consequences um, where that information, because it's already in the housing provider's hands, could be used um, for, for ill will um, and whether it could in ways uh, contribute to discrimination. So um, we'd be happy to look at it further um, and, and think through those issues with you as we move forward. Um, hi, uh, from the perspective of the Department for the Aging, I'm gonna echo uh, my colleagues here. We certainly support the intent of the bill and are committed to keeping seniors safe in their home. Um, we have a number of services, which I talked about in my testimony, um, around the assigned counsel project and partnering legal services with social services to um, address the needs of older adults who are faced with eviction proceedings. Um, we also work with seniors through a variety of in-home and support services um, to, to look at benefits and needs and keep them safely in their home. Um, we'd certainly welcome the opportunity to go through the details with you um, at some later date and, and, and work together. Thank you. And on another matter, the chair brought up the issue of security in senior buildings. Do you know what the requirement is in particularly NYCHA buildings that are senior buildings? What kinds of requirements are there for security? And I ask the question particularly because there is a building, a senior building in my district called a Woodson, where over the past three years, there have been two murders of seniors in the building, in their apartments, which still remain unsolved. So I'm wondering what, if you have that information, is the basic requirements? What are buildings required to do to have, provide security for seniors? Sure. Um, my colleagues from, Ni from NYCHA are not here today, so I think we'd have to follow up with them specifically to inquire about that matter. And, uh, um, I want to add the Department for the Aging is committed to elder justice, and, and we do a lot of work through our Elder Abuse and Crime Victim Resource Center um, that works extensively to, to meet the needs um, of older adults who have been victimized by crime and abuse, both from a preventive lens and um, from an intervention lens. Uh, I would appreciate getting the answer from uh, what NYCH is doing particularly. Thank you, thank you to the chairs. Thank you. Um, Council Member Kredencik, followed by Council Member Deutsch, with questions. Uh, I just want to say that we've been joined also by uh, Council Member Diana Ayala. Am I ready, Mr. Chair? Yes, Mr. Kredencik. Thank you, Madam Chair, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, everybody. Still morning, right? Okay. Um, 
I just want to follow up on Chair Cornegie's comments regarding the NORCs, um, just to kind of give them a boost, because they are such a critical resource. Yesterday I was with a bunch of people having lunch. Um, I represent uh, an area in eastern Queens where the city kind of meets the prairie, so it's, it's uh, very low density, and we have many people who have been living. It's not unusual, including my aunt, who has been living in her home for 70 years. So. Uh, it's not unusual to see people 50, 60, 70 years or more. And the NORCs, uh, which are run by Common Point uh, in my district, are among the first NORCs. Uh, I think they're state funded, but um, that's okay. Um, we work very closely with our state representatives. So I just want to give them a boost because they're, they're very important for us in keeping people in place, keeping um, our seniors in a community that they have real, literally helped to build because it was, they came over the hill, there was nothing there. Um, you know, I've met people 100 that have lived in, you know, it's not unusual. It's, it's getting less and less, but it's, it's not unusual. Um, the other question I have, um, since we're talking senior affordable housing, um, what's the minimum footprint for a, a building? How much land do you need to build a building on? Dep I know it depends on zoning. Like I asked this question yesterday, I was at school construction authority, I said, how much do you need to build a school? They said a minimum of 20,000 square feet. So if we wanted to build a building, hypothetically, what would we need? I think it depends on a number of factors, but unfortunately our colleagues from city planning aren't here today, so I think that might be something we could discuss okay. with them. All right. All right, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Can I do want to, um, if, I, oh. if I may, um, just one thing that might be beneficial in terms of NORCs where you, um, there are a number of um, senior homeowners specifically, we, um, we have launched very recently, only a month ago, our new Home Fix program, which um, is a home repair program that expands significantly on the resources that we had previously to help honor, homeowners do home repairs. Um, it's a, a program that we administer in partnership with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Um, as well as a couple other community-based organizations, the Prodnick Foundation, NHS of New York City, um, as, um, as well as AFI. And um, I think it's one of the things that we've tried to do there specifically is make sure that the financing is as, as affordable as possible, both for low-income uh, homeowners, but also for senior homeowners. Uh, seniors, unless they are middle income basically can qualify for zero interest uh, repair loans. Uh, we pair that with uh, financial and housing counseling if it's useful for the homeowner, but also we have built in some estate planning as well, which we found is particularly important for senior homeowners. Thank you. I'm sorry, I just want to ask, that particular program, are seniors able to access that if they're living in areas that are, um, what do you call, um, that are uh, where they need to make. Um, so, so there's a lot of neighborhoods in my in my district that are uh, protected in terms of uh, what do you call it? Yes, in historic districts, can they use those programs to make accessibility changes to their property in conjunction with what the guidelines for the other programs are? Yeah, so uh, the program actually uh, allows a broad set of repairs. We um, raise the amount of funding that's actually available. Uh, it, it varies, a, a single family property is eligible for up to $60,000, and then two family, 90, three family, 120, and a four family, $150,000. So it can be used to do more extensive renovations to a home. It can be used to do aging in place related improvements. Um, if you have a homeowner that has challenges um, and is looking to do modifications to their home. Uh, so it can be used very broadly. Window replacements, if you're in a historic district, uh, all of those things. And is this, are these grants or loans? They are loans. They're, um, they're, t they're two main types. There are, for low, very low income homeowners, there are uh, forgivable or evaporating loans. So um, the term depends on um, the type of, the amount of financing we're providing, but up to 15 years. Um, for um, 
middle and moderate income homeowners, they can be low interest loans that amortize. The idea is that unlike um, what you would see with a private lender where they have kind of set rates and terms and then they're gonna look at you know, your debt to income and your credit score and decide if you can afford that loan. Um, here, we um, look at what we can do to make sure that the homeowner can actually afford the financing necessary to do the repairs so they can remain in their home safely. Um, and so we'll actually modify the loan terms to make it affordable if necessary. So I'd, I'd personally like to hear more about that program because where seniors have tried to access similar programs, it's been based on the value of their property and not on their ability to pay or what their annual income is. And it absolutely puts people in a very precarious position over time and, and has actually, um, uh, to some degree, ex helped expedite displacement, especially of homeowners. So I, I'd just like to, uh, offline, hear a so little bit more about that program. We would be happy program. to talk to you. Thank you. Councilmember Deutsch, your question, and yeah, followed by Councilmember Rose. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so this question is for, is for um, the Human Rights Commission uh, for Zoe. Hi. Um, so two things, two questions. Uh, after a human rights complaint, what is the procedure after that? H how is it investigated by human rights? Does it go straight for a hearing? Um, is it, uh, does it go to litigation? So I want to know what the procedure is from beginning to end. And the second question is, um, if you could give me a scenario of uh, a pre-complaint intervention. Sure. Um, do you mind if I take those in reverse order so that I can give you sort of the life the life cycle of a case. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'll, I'll talk in broad terms about um, how, so, how a case comes to the commission and then the many paths that it can take. So yeah, I'm sorry, can you just move the mic? Yeah, thanks. Sure, so thank you for that. Um, so people can contact the commission uh, through multiple different avenues. Most cases come to us via 311. Um, we're happy to receive referrals directly um, from elected officials, from um, our colleagues at community-based organizations, um, and we do also receive um, complaints filed directly by attorneys who choose us as their, their venue of choice. So um, when we first receive an inquiry about a potential case of discrimination, um, there's a meeting that occurs um, first with our um, info line, and uh, that's just a very basic assessment of um, does this remotely fall within our jurisdiction? Did you mean, in fact, to contact uh, one of our sister agencies, or are you outside of the city of New York? Very, very basic jurisdictional questions. Um, we can, through that, um, determine if pre-complaint intervention might be a, a good first step and um, relevant to the, the topic of today's hearing. Um, issues where uh, disability access or reasonable accommodations are at play and often where people need very prompt interventions to help them um, enjoy the full use of their home. That, those often are the types of cases where we will make efforts um, both through our project Equal Access um, or through um, other parts of our law enforcement bureau uh, to reach out first to the housing provider um, and essentially to help liaise and notify um, covered entities about their obligations under the law. Um, it may involve working with some of our partners here today to um, help them leverage resources that are available around the city. Um, in essence, just to help people get the need, the, get the help that they need um, as quickly as possible. Um, if that is not uh, the end of the matter, if there is a discrimination case um, that, that we're going to proceed with, the first step, um, as you uh, alluded to, is, is the filing of a complaint. Um, I would highlight for, for everyone that um, we, uh, we at the commission, it's, a, it's no um, cost to use our services and our law enforcement bureau um, assists complainants in drafting uh, the complaints um, and filing that um, so counsel is not required. Um, when w our law enforcement bureau has two functions. Um, the first is it's, it serves as um, an investigator. Um, so when a complaint is first filed, they will 
um, send the complaint to the, the respondent party, um, ask for an answer um, responding to the allegations in the complaint, um, and an investigation may proceed from there. And depending on the nature of the case, the complexity, um, there's any number of investigative steps that they might engage in, so requests for information, there might be interviews of witnesses, um, site visits in some cases, particularly where things like um, accessibility in a building might be at issue. Um, and based on all of the information acquired up till that point um, through the investigation, uh, the Law Enforcement Bureau will determine uh, whether the case should proceed. So if a probable cause determination is made, um, the role of the Law Enforcement Bureau switches from that of a neutral investigator to that of a civil prosecutor on behalf of the city. Um, and that's when uh, a full litigation starts um, before uh, oath the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings. Um, and, and from that point, there's still multiple paths so the case can go forward. Um, it can go to a full trial. Many of our cases um, resolve through settlement. Um, we also have an office of mediation um, that can uh, play some role in, in mediating uh, settlements. So we have many tools available um, to help resolve, to resolve some cases. What is a typical complaint that you receive? That is a difficult question, um, just because we have so many categories of protected status um, across the three jurisdictional areas that are the, the main focus of our work. So that's employment, housing, public accommodations. Um, so I, I, perhaps I can answer. So no, in, in particular for senior housing. For senior housing. Um, I don't know if I have information on that, but I would be happy to look. It would be like um, hand, making it handicapped accessible, right? That would be one, one complaint? I think that we do, disability access um, is one of our uh, most prominent categories. Um, regardless of age, uh, I don't know if that constitutes the majority of our age-related complaints. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, failure to provide a reasonable accommodation. That's my, my question is, is that um, at the end of the day, we want to get the job done. We want to make sure that that senior who's living there Right. that whatever, whatever issues uh, he or she may have is taken care of. And I've seen that uh, from a complaint being filed until a determination or until a penalty is imposed could take sometimes several years, right? So during those several years, you still have the senior who is residing there who's not getting those accommodations and, um, through what complaint she's, she, um, he or she uh, put in with the Human Rights Commission. So my question, I guess, I see that the fines are hefty fines, and I also see that um, the uh, stakeholders of the, the, those buildings um, where you got those complaints, where you received those complaints, they would have to go through a, a specific training, right? So if, if a complaint comes in to the Human Rights Commission, Right, and it's something like uh, making making ADA, making you know handicapped accessible, or uh, issue with something else that could be corrected. Right, why does it get to that point where there is that hefty fine? Like, why doesn't the Human Rights Commission go in there and say, "Listen, if you don't get this done by within 30 days, you could have a sixty thousand dollar fine, and then you all have to go for training." Right. So, so why aren't we like proactive that it shouldn't get to the point where um, there's $5.3 million in damages and the city, I guess, makes the $800,000 in civil penalties that goes to the city, right? Civil penalties go to the city, that's So correct. how do we prevent it getting to that point where a senior has to go through all the hurdles and all the hassles and still uh, be in a position right. where it's not corrected when we could just correct it like this within 30 days by threatening that there is going to be um, a $60,000 fine or a $40,000 fine, and then there's a whole training process and everything. So that's why so, I, that's why so I maybe, don't. I can't maybe it'd be that. beneficial to talk more broadly about some of the uh, work the city has done to educate owners about um, how they can modify their buildings to make um, age-friendly improvements, reduce trip hazards, et cetera. Um, uh, the Department for the Aging worked with a number of agencies and city council to actually put a guide together um, that has best practices for how to modify buildings and individual apartments to do so. Um, uh, multiple agencies have uh, various financial incentive programs to help 
owners and residents um, a, a take on the cost of those improvements. Um, including yeah, but, yeah, but that, don't, that doesn't always work because if you have the bad actors, then they're not going to listen to the pamphlet. But my question is back that number one is that you know if there is those those high fines, right? Why can't that landlord be threatened and say, you know, something you're going to have to pay this, and you're going to have to go through a whole training. Let's correct it now. Let's get it done. Um, because what I'm hearing is what I'm seeing is that you're going through the whole process, right? And then it goes to courts. Then they have to, everyone has to hire lawyers. The condition is still there. Right, and then, and then at the end of the day, the city ends up getting eight hundred thousand dollars in civil penalties. So, is it an, an income thing, or is it taking care of our seniors? That's what I just don't fathom. I, I don't I understand that. I appreciate the question. So, in yeah. in fact, what you're suggesting is the the commission's approach. It's very, um, it is the exception to the rule where a case proceeds all the way to to a trial or even to a Supreme Court uh, appeal. Um, we do everything that we can to ensure that cases are resolved quickly um, and as soon as possible to ensure that folks get the help that they need, particularly with respect to um, issues like accommodations. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we have um, the Project Equal Access and pre-complaint intervention programs through our Law Enforcement Bureau, both of which are specifically targeted to, to the task that, that you're describing of ensuring um, that uh, housing providers are made aware of their obligations and the consequences no, yeah, all they those, could Yeah, all those are very good, but I'm still, I, I still understand. Because to me, it looks like it's not taking care of the seniors, it's a money grabber. That, that's what it looks like to me. I, so I just if wanna, I could speak to if We could have an offline uh, discussion if you want, but I'm going through this and I'm, uh, you know, I'm looking through this and I'm listening to the testimony, and I just don't understand because I like to get things done right away. And if there's a problem and if there's a human rights complaint, let's take care of it before. Can I ask you a question? What is the longest um, period of time from beginning of a complaint until maybe a possible trial? How many years could that take? Uh, I, don't have that. Head, I, I don't have that information uh, could it be? Could it be, could it be more than two years? We do have some cases, but it okay. depends on the complexity of so, the case as to how long. No, I understand that. Take. So, but there, there has to be a way to, to take care of our seniors and to get it done to get it done right away. So I, I'd, I'd love to have an offline sure. conversation there to see how- There is one point I'd, like, I'd love to respond to, um, which is with respect to, to fines and trainings, um, it is a priority of the commission to ensure that um, the remedies that we provide are proportionate um, to the sophistication, um, the willfulness of violations by respondent. So it is, it is not, when you, when you see a large number um, in a particular case, that may be reflective of the fact that it was a recalcitrant respondent who refused to engage in the early stages of a case with us despite repeated efforts by the Law Enforcement Bureau to engage them earlier to warn them about the repercussions, that they are a large, sophisticated entity. There may have been multiple violations of the law. So where we're dealing with smaller entities, where there are people who are endeavoring to comply if they were unaware of their... Those are instances where we would look, either, there are some cases where there are no fines at all. We may just do a know your rights training about the law. So we try to be proportionate so, uh, to the nature yeah, of so the Yes, I'd violation. love to be invited to one of your complaints. That are like, I'd like to see what the process is for myself. And, and, and I just want to see for myself how, how it could get resolved or how it can get resolved that things have to go on for more than two years. Um, because be I, still, I still don't understand it, and unless I actually like know a specific case that you could tell me. So I'd like to speak to you offline. If I'd be could. happy to do okay, that. Great. Thank you. Okay, so I'll leave you my card. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, Councilmember Deutsch, yeah. If you could follow up offline. But I think one of the questions that raised up with that is that the interagency coordination. So if someone files a complaint with human rights and involves a senior reasonable accommodation, are there any kind of referral discussion with HPD or with DIFTA to really help the senior while the case might be, you know, takes time, but at least get the repair done or, or get, you know, to be able to make sure that the senior is okay? Yes, again, as, as I mentioned earlier, um, while we're, while we're endeavoring to uh, resolve cases, we're, we're constantly working with our partners throughout the city, that's our sister agencies, as well as any community groups that may be um, implicated in the case. Okay. Um, we've been joined by Council Member Traeger and Council Member Vallone. 
Uh, Council Member Rose with questions. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. And I wanna thank Council, um, Council Member Chin and, and the chair of this committee for her tireless efforts um, because we are actually going to get our first neighborhood north on Staten Island. And she's been working at this tirelessly since she's been the chair. So I wanna thank her for recognizing you know, that need. Um, and because Staten Island has a very unique housing you know, stock, um, I was wondering if you could give me the percentage of, uh, senior, um, of seniors that are on Scree and she, um, because we have, I know it's a limited number, but could you tell me how many? Uh, I don't have that broken down by borough. Both HPD and the Department of Finance administer the SCREE program. Mm -hmm. uh, and my colleagues from DOF are not here today. But uh, across the city uh, in 2019, there we had six more than 62,000 uh, seniors uh, apply for receive SCREE. Okay, so I, I know the number is significantly less um, on Staten Island. Um, and so these programs are um, grossly underutilized. How is it that um, people are made aware of, of these programs and you know, how they qualify for them? Sure, so we've um, actually expanded screen the last couple of years. We mm -hmm. raised the income eligibility, right. as you may mm -hmm. be aware, to $50,000, mm -hmm. which means there's um, many more households that are eligible. Uh, we have expanded outreach. Um, I'd have to have my colleagues at Department of Finance follow up specifically on the portion that they administer. Um, at HPD, we administer the portion um, um, of SCREE that serves specifically HGFC cooperatives as well as Mitchell Lama properties. And uh, we do very expansive outreach. Um, there And those properties, either where appropriate, we will um, ensure that there is a section eight that we can allocate to the property or scree. Um, you can't do both at the same time. So I believe actually mm -hmm. there are a couple of Mitchell Lamas in Staten Island where we actually I use only, yeah. section eight instead of um, scree. Yeah, they have section eight. Um, however, is there any way, because of our unique housing situation, we have very little rent regulated um, mm -hmm. housing. Um, how would we, would we be able to expand this program to, um, to other types of housing uh, because it doesn't exist, but the need is, is so, um, so extensive uh, that my seniors are, are not able to find affordable housing. Um, you know, we have a lot of private homeowners, landlords, um, what is the conversation? How, how do I start the conversation to extend this type of benefit to a, a different type of housing stock um, sure. that doesn't exist in Staten Island? Sure. So I think we're or happy, limited. absolutely happy to talk about um, where you think the gaps may be mm -hmm. and who particularly you are concerned with and are interested in. Uh, serving, um, I, are you concerned more with renters or with homeowners? Um, with renters. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, so I think it's worth a follow-up conversation to mm -hmm. understand more what your particular concerns on or the vulnerabilities that you're trying to address. Okay, and, um, and there's such a large waiting list. Um, I think it's over 200,000 people now. Um, and uh, HPD, you, you did say that you're gonna address um, another hundred thousand, but by, that's by the year twenty twenty six. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if we have a waiting list of two hundred thousand applicants now, how are we going to actually meet the need? And why do we? Why can't we make it a priority to meet the housing needs of affordable housing for seniors before twenty twenty six? Um, this administration won't even be in office. Mm -hmm. now, how do we ensure that the, uh, the housing needs uh, with the projected numbers that we have now 
is, is even going to be addressed? And why can't we make it a priority so that we're not looking at out years where, you know, this might not even become a reality? Sure. So um, as part of our, so this administration has committed a significant amount of resources to expanding uh, new home ownership and preserving existing home ownership um, within the city. Um, we have uh, a commitment of $13.5 billion uh, to support affordable housing throughout the city, of which um, about $1.9 billion was committed as housing, uh, housing York 2.0. Um, which, uh, for which the Seniors First Initiative was one of the primary initiatives um, that we um, announced at that point in time. Um, I think your, your question about how do we ensure the resources, certainly through the budget. Um, we've also created a number of programmatic initiatives um, that we have put out there. Uh, including the Aging in Place initiative, where we've changed the way that we actually do business, mm -hmm. um, meaning that the, now when we assess the needs of an individual property that is coming to us for renovation financing, whether it's a, a homeowner that's looking for help or it's a multifamily property, um, we are now, the assessment methodology has built into it mm -hmm. that we are, the owner is required to look at things like um, mobility, uh, throughout the building, right? Is there appropriate lighting? Are there grab bars and, and uh, ways uh, and staircases in common areas that help people move safely? Um, we are also do that within an individual apartments. Um, residents are given a survey, and that means that once the modifications are done for one resident, the next resident there also put, has the access to those modifications. Um, we've also tried to expand um, the ways in which we advertise um, and make sure that residents throughout New York City know about affordable housing and have access to those opportunities. Um, as you know, we uh, launched Housing Connect back in 2013 and are looking to, uh, are now rolling out Housing Connect 2.0, which will have additional features. I'm not the marketing expert right. at the uh -huh. agency, but mm -hmm. we'll have additional features so that uh, residents can actually identify what exactly they're looking um, for in terms of size of the unit, um, location, et cetera, that will hopefully help them find resources within the communities that they're interested in living. Um, the waiting lists um, are sometimes problematic um, when we look at the lottery. What are we doing to make sure that um, lottery recipients are fairly accessed and get the apartments. I've, I've gotten some complaints where there, um, um, there was some uh, racial um, discrimination when the, the actual person shows up to respond to um, the lottery and that the apartment is available and, um, and suddenly it's not available. So maybe so, I can speak about, I'm sorry, yeah. I don't want to cut you off. No, go okay. Ahead. So maybe I can speak about HPD's part of that process, mm -hmm. and then if, if you want to add anything to it as well, that would be great. So um, again, I don't run the marketing team, I run the preservation team at HPD, mm -hmm. but um, we do get access to any lottery logs as well as applicant files, so if there is a concern, we, can, we also, it, we don't outsource all of that, yeah. we do independently verify. Um, I can follow up with our marketing team to talk more about that particular procedure and how it works and the, the concerns that you've raised. Yeah, it's becoming, you know, a, a big concern um, in my district. Um, I would just add that we'd, we'd be happy to talk to you more about that offline. Thank you. Okay. And I just wanted to say to HPD, thank you. You know, um, we just went through a ULER, a huge ULER affordable housing in our Bay Street corridor. And, um, and it, was, it was really a struggle to get 100% affordability on the waterfront. And um, I want to thank you for your efforts to uh, help us, you know, do that. And I want to make sure that those projects move along swiftly so that, you know, it can be a reality. I know I'm not going to see it before the end of my term, but I surely don't want it to be 
generations before it happens. So um, thank you for helping us make that a reality, a, a possibility. Now I want to see it as a reality, so thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, we're joined by Council Member uh, Torres and uh, Council Member Eugene. So I just have a couple of follow-up questions uh, with HPD. Is now, we, you know, we know that it's such a, a great need for more senior housing, and I know you're talking about, you know, the mayors, you know, made the commitment. Um, how many senior affordable housing projects um, are currently in the pipeline, and what stage are they at? Are we going to be able to, uh, you know, meet the goal that was set up? Um, thank you for the question. Um, so, you know, um, as we stated earlier, we have produced 8, over 8,500 units of housing specifically for seniors. Um, we have a very, very robust pipeline of additional projects in the works. Um, it is very hard to uh, provide detail on projects in our pipeline until we get to construction closing um, because there are a lot of shifting pieces. Um, so a little hard to do that, but we are on track to achieve the goals um, and the commitments under the Seniors First Initiative. Um, again, the projects that we can talk about a little bit more specifically are the ones on public sites. So again, you know, I said there are 24 sites that we've been working on. Um, several of those have completed or are in construction, and we are queued up to move the, the remainder forward shortly. And just to the other piece I want to highlight, um, uh, we are doing really expansive outreach on the 202 specifically. We've done uh, jointly with uh, HUD, along with LISC, who has their um, a program specifically de designed for outreach to uh, 202s. We've done seven events in the last year, uh, a little over a year now. Uh, to make sure that owners of 202 uh, properties specifically know about the resources and that we are interested in working with them. That's the that's part of preservation. Yes. But when uh, you were talking about the 24 sites, so how many units are um, in total are in that 24 sites? I'll have to get back to you with a specific number. Okay. It's got to be in your head. You got to figure out those numbers. Um, I have a, a turn back to a question for DIFTA. Um, you know, there's been a lot of excitement about the home sharing program, and the mayor was talking about this is a big action um, in the FY19 budget. Uh, so, how is that going? I mean, are we making more matches? Uh, are we getting, you know, more seniors? Because we also heard that there was some problem. Uh, because the host uh, person, uh, the senior who's the host, uh, were getting um, the income on a monthly basis, and then they now are not. So there's some issue that came up with the home sharing program that we heard from constituents. Uh, but if you can talk about the progress. Sure. Um, so we are, you know, we're, we're fairly early in, into the fiscal year. We are seeing increases um, in, in the number of matches made. I, I think you know this is a very targeted, innovative program. We've been really working to expand outreach um, as well as our partnerships around this. So for example, um, one sister agency that we've um, begun partnering with is DYCD to look at um, the aging out of transitional age youth and how we could potentially look at finding appropriate matches between these young adults who have um, significant housing needs as well as our older adults um, who also um, have needs around um, financial stability and or social isolation. So we are seeing some promising movements um, and you know, looking forward to advancing our thinking and, and matching um, and marketing around this program. Um, in terms of the, the second issue um, that you mentioned around paying the host, are you saying the host is, is a senior? No, the host is senior. There's the, the host issue is a about senior the subsidy. 
And they're not receiving a payment from the, the share mate? No, I mean, there the is a, there's a subsidy they, you know, they were anticipating it should be every month. Mm -hmm. And then now it's like there's a shift to it's not every month, then it's every like six months, which couldn't create a hardship uh, right. for the, the host because they were expecting um, this income. So um, I'm happy to look into that, mm -hmm. and I will look into that and, and certainly get back to you. I'm, you I'm not immediately aware um, of, of what you're uh, mentioning. Do you have any number in terms of how many match uh, were made in this year or the past year with this, the new Would expansion? You? It's a targeted program, and, um, and and there are definitely challenges inherent um, to the, this innovative model, um, particularly around finding people that have extra space available in their home to rent, whether it's the older adult or, or some other um, person who's willing to rent um, their their house and share it with another individual. Um, we are seeing increases um, as a result of our new partnerships and marketing model. Um, so we're optimistic that we will see increases this year and we will work towards um, furthering our relationships and marketing strategy to continue to see more increases going forward. Okay, so I would like you to get us some specific number mm -hmm. later, if you don't have it now, in terms of um, the success of the program, in terms of numbers sure. and match that was done. Because the council has been you know, supporting yes. New York Foundation for Senior before the mayor you know, put in so-called new funding mm -hmm. to help mm -hmm. you know, expand the program. So it's not an easy program to run, and we know that, and right. we've been supplementing um, funding to help them uh, to do that. So that's why we okay. wanted to really get more information um, on that. And I just wanted to go back on uh, the question of uh, the SCREE program. And because I know that we have past hearing when we um, you know, talk about it and we've heard from seniors who are actually paying uh, more than 30% of their income for rent, even though they've gotten screed, they might have gotten into the program late, and there is no uh, subsidy program uh, from the city that can help them, you know, they're paying more than 50% of their income uh, for rent, even though they have screed. And this is an issue in some of the new development that are coming up, uh, like in my district. Uh, you know, some of the senior who were still working and they were so excited and happy. They won the lottery. They got into a senior housing. Great. And now they are going to be retiring. So their income is going to drop. So now, you know, we have to help them apply for SCREE uh, right away so at least their rent don't go up. But now their income drops they might not be able to afford the rent that they were able to afford when they first move in based on their income. And somehow, you know, the, the management, whatever, well, hey, if you can't pay your rent, then you're gonna be evicted. So I think this is something that the city really need to look at these affordable, you know, housing program. When people move in, they could afford the rent, but if they, their income drop or if they are seniors and they retire, how are we going to be make sure that they can continue uh, to be able to live uh, in the, you know, in their home and not get evicted? So that should be something that we should look at as a, as a preservation program because yeah. we don't want them to be able to move in because there's so many senior applying when we're talking about waiting lists. I mean, we had 99 units in the Lower East Side with Essex Crossing and 65,000 senior apply. I mean, it just that's such a tremendous need out there. But we want to make sure that if they're lucky enough to get in, that they can stay. So that, that is something that we want to look at the, the SCREE program. And we've been advocating with the state to see if there's a rollback. Uh, because the city is the one that's paying, right? Because the landlord is getting um, their property tax decrease, you know, pay the screen. So we're the one that's paying, but then we have to rely on the state to pass the law, to change the law. 
So somehow, I think, as a city, we should really look at what we can do proactively on these programs to help seniors stay in their home. Same thing like the NORC program that you know, my colleagues are talking about. There's a great need for it, the one in Staten Island, the one in Brooklyn, the one in Chinatown that we just started this year, is council discretionary funding because there is no funding, increased funding coming from the state. I mean, it's a state-funded program, the NORC program. But so we should take a look at, you know, with the Department of Aging, whether the city should start a funding stream that can support these kind of programs and not be discretionary, right? That there should be a permanent funding stream to help start NORC programs, because that's part of preservation, helping seniors stay in their home when the services and the activity and the wellness program, all those things that are incorporated in a, a naturally occurring retirement community. We know how successful they are. So there's gonna be more and more, and that is a great preservation tool that is not just a place to live, but to make sure, make sure the services are there. So I think that's something, the holistic approach that we should look at and see how we can you know, access funding to do that because the state and the federal government, they're not providing the resources. They're not providing the funding. Like 202, what happened to 202? There was no more 202 funding. And now we're preserving the 202? How come the federal government is not providing funding to do that? But the city has to come in because we don't want those building to go private. We don't want to lose any affordable senior housing. So I think that as a city, we need to step up. We need to figure out a way uh, to make sure that we preserve and we build uh, more senior housing as, as much as we can to meet the growing needs. Yeah, I think we agree um, uh, that you know anything we can do to help uh, seniors stay in their homes uh, safely and uh, you know a rent or if they're in, uh, uh, they own their property to continue to afford to remain in their home is, is critically important. And I think we would be happy to explore any new ideas that you have for how we can, um, we can support uh, more at the city level. And I do wanna mention, it's great to hear all this um, positive feedback around the NORCs. It's something we're really proud and excited about, and we think it's the right model in terms of aging in place and pushing services in. Um, and um, you know, we also certainly welcome discussion around new ideas, resources, opportunities. Um, I, I did wanna mention there are 28 um, city-funded NORCs that are, that are funded with city tax dollars? Not enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that DIFTA needs more uh, funding because the DIFTA's budget is less than half a percent of the city's budget. Even though we fought every year to make it bigger, but the city's budget is getting bigger. So we're not catching up, okay? So I think that we need a budget that really match the growing number of seniors that we have in the city. So we uh, look forward to working you know, with all of you to make sure our seniors are taken care of. Uh, any other questions from uh, our colleague? Oh, Chair. Um, I, I just wanna ask um, on the line of questioning that the Chair, Co-Chair mentioned in regards to funding, the Home Fix program. I know that I myself and I'm sure that my colleagues are going to uh, demand in the upcoming budget that that be baseline. Um, certainly, you know, I, I'd love to hear what your opinion on that and whether you'd be in advocacy with us around baseline funding for Home Fix. Um, we'd be happy to talk to you. And we, um, the program, we, as I mentioned, we launched uh, a month ago. Um, we've been, I think on average through the current programs, um, serving a couple dozen homeowners a year. <laughs> Um, we budgeted for this program. We, we hope to expand it to 100 to 150 homeowners a year, and we have seen um, in the first month um, interest in the program for over from over 500 homeowners. Um, so I think we are happy to explore 
how we can make sure that the program is structured in the right way and has sufficient resources so that it can meet the demand. Uh, uh, but I ask that um, you, you include uh, at least my co-chair in those in that dialogue and those conversations as you're building that program out. Sure. Because um, she's got her finger on the pulse. Uh, tremendously, all of us have seniors in our district, but I, I certainly defer to my co-chair and the great work that she's done in and around this. I'm just pointing out that because of the the amount of homeowners I have in my district, I can see this as being a very viable program. Great. Uh, We're happy to seniors. talk about that. Uh, so I just want to talk briefly, ask briefly about the Sarah program. Mm -hmm. um, so as of today, how many affordable units are were created through HPD's senior affordable affordable rental apartments? Uh, so approximately 3,000 units. And by 2022, how many affordable units are expected to be created through the SARA program? Um, so it's a little hard to project exact numbers through that specific program uh, because, again, we produce senior units through a variety of programs. So um, we may have a, an ELLA building that has a set aside for senior units that um, we are allowed to incorporate because of changes through ZQA. Um, so hard to give an exact number, but we expect to continue to produce more. Do you have the number of seniors themselves, literally, who've benefited from the program? Um, not with me currently, no. Um, it may have been mentioned before, but it, uh, and if it has, just please flag for me. Uh, but HPD's SARA term sheet has now has not been updated since 2014. Is the administration considering revisions or updates to the term sheet? Um, so we were definitely considering updates, um, and we welcome feedback if you have any on changes. How does HPD? and DIFTA advertise the SARA program, and how do seniors become aware of this program? Um, so the SARA program is a financing program for, uh, for building, for landowners. So um, it would be a developer that would um, work with HPD to develop a project, um, and we advertise the SARA program along with all of our other new construction financing programs. So it's not advertised to the individuals, it's advertised to the developer. Correct. Um, but once a, once a senior, a SARA building is marketed on Housing Connect, um, all of our marketing tools that we use to outreach to communities are, are used for those buildings as well. Uh, what, what marketing tools are those? Sure. So uh, one moment. So um, we have uh, HPD has 43 nonprofit uh, housing ambassadors um, that we work with. Um, that, that has a, that's an expanded program, so in, um, when we launched the program, we had 17. We now have 43 ambassadors. Um, housing ambassadors are, are available to meet with uh, households individually, or they also hold public events. Um, well, yeah, are housing ambassadors individuals or organizations? They are organizations, um, but uh, council, city council offices can also become housing ambassadors. Uh, community boards can become housing ambassadors. Um, so we really rely on our partners to do a lot of outreach. Um, they will, they you can assist uh, seniors in applying for Housing Connect, and this is not just for Sarah buildings, but for any unit marketed on Housing Connect, a senior can apply for. Um, we have increased our language access, so if a, a senior um, needs an application either in paper or electronically in a different language, we, we have that, and the housing ambassadors can help. Um, provide that. We also have our Ready to Rent program, which we rolled out with DCA. Um, so a variety of things that we've been... Um, so I actually have uh, the distinct pleasure of serving as the council's um, chair to the Democratic Conference. And, I certainly, and as such, we disseminate a newsletter. Uh, I'd love to be able to include in that newsletter the criteria for being a housing ambassador as it relates to the council. So if you could get that to me. Um, I would get it right out to my colleagues, who I'm sure, uh, based on capacity within their offices, would love to participate. Sure, we'll follow up. Thank you. And Chair, I'd like to add that the Department for the Aging posts a housing resource guide on our website, as well as um, routinely goes to senior centers to talk to older adults about housing options and benefits and resources that are available to them as part of our continual outreach efforts. So just. Um, Meaning, no disrespect, I always get the willies when I think about websites and seniors. So, um, we, we should work together. I, I'm not saying that, listen, yes. we, everybody has to move, some of us more reluctantly than others, right. into the techno technological age. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. But when it, as it relates to that, there's always this huge gray area as to access the information through 
um, electronic sources for seniors. So while that's a part and mm -hmm. we should be moving towards sure. that, yep. uh, incrementally we should try to get our seniors to that place. I know in my district some of my seniors uh, just aren't ready and actually in my district I'm considered a senior. In my house, at least, I'm considered a senior. So, and I'm definitely not ready. So, um, I listen to OATS program and there's other great programs that prepare our seniors to be program. technologically yeah. savvy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I respect and appreciate those. It's just that as soon as I hear that this, this mm -hmm. information being disseminated through electronic means, it kind of makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Okay, that's un understood. It's a multi-pronged approach that's part of our approach. I mean, part of it is electronic and, 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 and what you're speaking of certainly resonates and it's also changing and it's not always just a senior that's looking at these resources. Sometimes it's a caregiver or a loved one. Sure. Um, so um, so I, I think there's certainly a place for social media and the web. Yeah. Um, that said, we're in senior centers um, routinely talking to older adults face to face. So we certainly appreciate the limitations of technology as an incomplete part of outreach and a solution. Although I, I do think it's part of it. And, and just for the record, that was not an indictment of what you what you do or mm -hmm. how you disseminate your information. It just you know, with, this is a very slow good. process in this yeah. transition yeah. Uh, for us to total uh, electronics, and I could feel. The, the spirit of my seniors channeled through me to, to, <laughs> to let you know that some of them have not yet prepared themselves in the way that they can access all of their information uh, electronically, but thank you. Sure. Yeah, I think definitely with some of the new, the new initiative from HPD on um, home repairs and, and how to make you know, the apartment or the building accessible, I think those information I assume is share on DIFTA's website. We just launched. I don't know that we've done that yet, but we were happy to do that. That's a great idea. Okay, because you, <laughs> you know that's why like a we senior will. would go to yes. uh, DIFTA first, Department for the Aging first, before they go to HPD. Yes. So I think that interagency, you got to really um, work on that. Oh, we've been joined by Councilmember Rivera. Question. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I don't, I don't have a question, but I just, because the Department of Buildings isn't here, and I just wanted to ask that as we develop new senior housing and as we preserve existing senior housing, that we really take security into account, and I know that you all are very, very serious about that, but even something as simple as scaffolding when you're complying with local laws in terms of facade work, just the lighting underneath there sometimes is dark and you know as we get older maybe it's our mobility maybe it's our vision maybe it's our hearing as we're constructing these new buildings that we're looking at you know in the stairways the signage how large it is is braille necessary is are, are the elevators do they need a different kind of sound in terms of how using technology to actually speak to the tenant so i just wanted to, to ask that as we construct and preserve that we really just try to take all those kinds of nuances into account. I have a lot of norks, thankfully, and I'm looking forward to adding another one very soon. And even just under scaffolding, they want me to add lighting. So we're looking at street safety, and I know that you have a lot of interagency communication when you construct these buildings, and I want to thank you for your work, but just try to even think about every exit having that button to push because maybe you're not in a wheelchair but you, maybe the door is heavy i, I receive all kinds of uh, concerns from my constituents and i just want us to to be th the best producer of these buildings so, so i just want to thank you for all your work thus far and to the chair for allowing me to speak for a minute oh thank you thank you for your suggestions and comments yeah because some of the senior building we've gotten feedback um you know like if they have wheelchair or they're on a walker, they can't open the door. So some of the senior building now have the automatic sliding you know, entrance doors. And so I think that is something that we need to take into consideration in new building and preservation building that those are the needs because seniors cannot you know, do certain things and something will make it better like just these automatic doors uh, to really take those into consideration. Um, I know that we've asked for a lot of statistics and it, whatever you don't have uh, with you today and you promise you will send it to us and we expect that you deliver, uh, okay? <laughs> we understand. <laughs>
So, uh, so we expect those uh, information, and we look forward to you know, advocating with you, especially on the next budget, to make sure that we have enough resources to support our seniors and all this new wonderful program, and to make sure that they are permanent funding and not just you know, discretionary, just one-shot deal. So we're gonna be working very hard on that. So thank you for being here, and we look forward to continue working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, so, thank much. you so much. So we're gonna call up the, the next panel. We have uh, Alexander Riley, the Legal Aid uh, Society, Kathleen Andrew from Live On New York, Peter Kempner from Volunteers of Legal Services, Su Suhali Mendez, Oh. And then uh, Stacy Viragos. Sorry if I pronounced your name <laughs> not correctly. Uh, please identify yourself and your organization. Miss. Yeah, that's it. Yes, please begin. Uh, thank you uh, to the, the council chairs, Cornegy and Chin, for this opportunity. Um, I'm Alexander Riley, director of the elder law practice, uh, the civil practice of the Legal Aid Society. Uh, we very much appreciate the opportunity to testify uh, about these two bills specifically and more generally about the, the need for affordable housing for older New Yorkers. Uh, as you probably know, the Legal Aid Society is the, the oldest and largest uh, nonprofit law firm uh, in the country, and uh, we annually assist uh, low-income people on more than 300,000 matters in the realms of civil practice, juvenile rights practice, and criminal defense practice. Um, I am based at the Legal Aid Society's Brooklyn office for the aging, where for decades we've used a a multidisciplinary approach with uh, lawyers, social workers, paralegals to help our clients uh, age safely in place. Um, first of all, with respect to intro six uh, regarding the eviction of elderly tenants, um, we certainly support uh, the goal of, of this legislation and thank uh, Councilmember Barron for having um, uh, continued uh, to, uh, to work toward its, its passage. Um, a couple of things we wanted to note. One is that, uh, interestingly, the um, 225 defines senior as, uh, as age 62, um, excuse me, as age 60, uh, intro six defines senior uh, as 62, so we would encourage that the, uh, the council to adopt actually the age 60 for this, uh, for this particular legislation. Um, I, I'm sure that uh, at least one of my colleagues at the table is going to talk more about uh, the extent to which low-income seniors are actually able to take advantage of free legal services at the moment, um, given the current limitation income-wise to 200% of the poverty level under universal access. Um, I'll mention a couple things in relation to this. One is uh, certainly at the moment, many older adults who are subject to uh, eviction proceedings in New York City do not qualify, and therefore uh, it would be helpful to the extent that HPD is going to be conveying information uh, about legal services options that they include um, 
the contact information for bar, the various uh, borough-based bar associations um, so that older people who have the means can uh, have a, an option, an opportunity to secure private counsel if appropriate. Um, I was interested to hear the uh, Human Rights Council uh, Commission's counsel expressing concern about uh, landlords obtaining information about people regarding uh, poten potentially protect protected status related information. Certainly share that concern, but I would note that there is a kind of analog with the existing requirement of New York City Marshals to do an investigation to determine whether there's someone who is at risk in an apartment who is going to be subject to eviction. Uh, so even under current rules, um, there is a requirement that uh, a marshal uh, try to obtain that information and convey it to the Department of Ev Investigation, which then conveys it to Adult Protective Services. Um, two other uh, things in, uh, with respect to Intro 6, I was pleased to hear the discussion of the Design Council uh, project program. Uh, the Legal Aid Society is one of the uh, providers uh, of this service. Um, I think it's a great program, but currently the, the number of cases that are handled under the ACP is very, very small compared to the need out there. So we would certainly hope uh, that there would be an increase in funding for that and, and uh, a corresponding increase in number of cases. Um, in addition, even uh, people who, older adults who qualify with respect to their income uh, for free legal services who might receive notification from HD, HPD about legal services providers might uh, have the kind of case um, for which there is uh, no defense currently, with so-called no-cause evictions. Um, so uh, there, there is uh, support for uh, legislation, this is beyond the scope of today's discussion, but providing protections to people who are in unregulated apartments. I, we have a client right now who's been renting the same unregulated apartment for 20 years, and uh, we're trying to help her with a retaliatory eviction defense, but even if we prevail on that, she eventually probably will, will have to move out of that apartment in the absence of, uh, of uh, any pr protections. With respect to uh, intro 225, um, we uh, certainly applaud the council's interest in expanding older and disabled apartment dwellers' access to protective devices. Um, however, we note, as did uh, the New York City uh, Human Rights Commission Council, that uh, the New York City Human Rights Law already requires a landlord to make uh, reasonable modifications at its expense. Uh, to disabled persons as a reasonable accommodation of their disability. Um, so to that extent, to the extent that the bill is shifting that cost from the landlord to the taxpayer, uh, we certainly have concern about that. However, uh, this legislation is uh, of great interest because it expands the pool of people who would be entitled to these kinds of modifications, specifically to people who uh, are older but who are not yet disabled uh, and who want these kinds of protective devices um, to prevent themselves beco from becoming disabled. So to that extent, uh, this would, would be a wonderful thing. Um, a couple of other things I wanted to mention in response to uh, some comments that were made earlier. Um, uh, Chair Chin, you mentioned uh, a problem in relation to the home share program with respect to a subsidy. Um, I will contact your office to try to get some more information about that because we'd be, I would be interested to know uh, what kinds of problems your constituents are, include, uh, are encountering in that respect. One thing I will note about the home share program that has always concerned me a bit is what happens when the relationship between the person who has brought the, uh, the roommate in, uh, what happens when that relationship goes south. Um, the, I don't know the extent to which DIFTA or uh, the New York Foundation for Seniors can help to intervene in that situation. Uh, 
there is certainly no funding for, and I'm not necessarily advocating it, but there, it's a fact that there's no funding to help an older person try to evict a problem roommate. So uh, an older person would, uh, would have to go to housing court pro se uh, to try to sort, sort out that problem. So I'd be interested to know what these agencies do in these situations. And then finally, with respect to SCREE, Council Member Chin um, also brought up some issues regarding this. Um, we certainly share the, uh, the belief that this is a critical program. We even, in my office, we have a retired volunteer lawyer who does nothing but help seniors with SCREE applications and, re and uh, reviews, uh, recertifications. But yes, uh, we very much share Council Member Chin's concern that uh, somebody who applies uh, for SCREE by necessity many years after age 62 may find themselves nonetheless unable to afford their apartment uh, because their income has dropped. So that, uh, that is, it, it's not like the Section 8 program in that sense at all. And finally, uh, just the last thing I'll, I will mention, uh, it has to do with what are called redeterminations. Um, I, it's possible one of my colleagues will discuss this as well. But uh, currently, if a, a SCREE household uh, faces a drop in income of 20% or more, the tenant share can be redetermined to, uh, to lower the share to account for that drop. But the way the system works currently, it's the, the onus is entirely on the tenant, the SCREE recipient, to know that this possibility exists and to apply for it. Uh, we think that the Department of Finance and uh, to the extent the HPD administers the program should look out for these situations and affirmatively take steps to help the SCREE recipient um, apply for these redeterminations or even to just proce process them on their own. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, especially the, the last program that you talk about. If you could send us a little bit more information, because I don't think, I don't know about that program where there is a, if your income or your household income dropped 20%? Yes, yeah, so, so the, the way this typically happens is that uh, someone, someone dies, uh, someone's spouse dies, the, oh. the social, social security disappears, or you know, somebody moves out, uh, that sort of thing. And so the, 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 the rules say that upon a redetermination application, the, the tenant's frozen rent is supposed to be adjusted downward to account for this change. But again, uh, the, the agencies do not look out for these changes and implement these reductions um, themselves. They wait to receive an application from the, the tenant who, you know, after, some, after your spouse has died, the first thing that probably comes to mind is not to go on the SCREE website and try to find out, you know, what, what do I need to do next? Uh, so we, I think, and this is anecdotal, but I think that this option is vastly under, underutilized. Or they wait until recertification and then that, you know, issue that their income is less now and and then wait for the agency to determine. But then they still had to pay um, the higher rent, higher portion before That's right. the certification. And, yeah. and the agency will not of its own accord redetermine. The agency waits for a specific separate redetermination application. Hmm. Okay, we'll definitely take a look at that. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Caitlin Andrews. I'm here on behalf of Live on New York. Live on New York is a membership organization representing about 100 community-based organizations that serve seniors across the five boroughs. We also are proud to convene our Affordable Senior Housing Coalition, which includes roughly 25 nonprofit affordable senior housing developers and other stakeholders that work together to ensure the needs of seniors are served throughout New York City as the city continues to expand its programs. Um, I know we've really well explicated the need that exists across the city, but I do want to touch on one statistic. A recent study came out by the University of Pennsylvania that uh, took a look at New York City's older adult population currently existing in shelter, and with the um, projections that they were able to take a look at what that is projected to become, and the estimate was that by 2030, 
it is likely that 7,000 older adults will be in the shelter system. That is up from roughly 1,438 individuals who spent last December in temporary shelter. The reason that I point this out so explicitly is that I don't think that we have hit the tip of the iceberg in terms of the housing crisis that exists for seniors, and that's why it's so important that we're having today's hearing, and I thank the chairs for the opportunity to testify. Um, I do certainly appreciate and respect the administration's ongoing efforts, and the Seniors First Initiative is a really historic um, pillar of the city's housing plan and a level of intent to serve seniors that need affordable housing that we've not seen previously. Through this initiative, New York City is now home to the nation's first LGBTQ friendly affordable senior housing development that was developed by SAGE and partners. Queens was, has opened its doors to Hannock's new environmentally friendly housing building, which I know Stacy will talk about today. Um, and the Bronx has wel welcomed Wish Fish's Trace Fuentes, which will bring significant new healthcare re resources to the Bronx community. And those are just three projects, and they represent what is possible when we continue to make investments. Um, with that said, I do want to create some recommendations on how we can continue to refine and improve the program and the resources we have today. First and most importantly, we strongly recommend an increase to the per unit allocation of service funds through the SARA program that is administered by HRA. We recommend that $3,000 per unit per senior that is coming from the Housing Connect system be allocated through this program. Currently, only $5,000 in funding is awarded per SARA unit that is occupied by a formerly homeless senior, which makes up 30% of the building's unit. That means that 70% of the building does not receive service subsidy. With that said, the 30% of funding that is received is expected to serve all of the tenants. So while we certainly appreciate the inclusive nature of this funding and would never want um, services in a building to be only targeted to one demographic, we do believe that the service amount that is currently available is not sufficient to serve the building in the way that is needed for robust programming for seniors. I point this out um, specifically in terms of the security questions that were asked earlier. Um, a number of providers we know would love to offer 24-7 security in their buildings and know that this is something that seniors need. And beyond just a security perspective, it's important for a senior to have a face when they walk in the door and somebody who can say, is everything all right? Do you need um, assistance maybe to call an ambulance in the middle of the night or whatever that senior might need outside of the service um, pr perspective of benefits after applications and all of that. Um, so I think that that front desk service really needs to be something that is explicitly funded and make sure that adequate funding is available for all housing pr providers to do so. Um, I also want to reiterate that funding needs to be increased. Recently, City Council um, passed the prevailing wage legislation, which is really exciting for building service workers. However, that does not extend to the human service workers that are in the building, which are predominantly female, predominantly women of color. So we are going to see a bit of um, disparity within building services, and we wanna make sure that the human services counterparts in those buildings also receive wage increases as well, which is why this $3,000 per unit that would go to the 70% of units that are unfunded would be so important. Um, secondly, I think that Live on New York would like to continue to emphasize the city's need to develop housing outside of the NYCHA Next Gen program. As city land becomes available, it's important that we capitalize on those opportunities for nonprofits to develop housing. Um, Additionally, we need to ensure that senior housing is prioritized in the pipeline. We know that there's only so many resources from the federal government that come through to make these buildings possible, whether it be volume cap or um, project-based vouchers, and we need to know 
that when determining what projects are going to be funded, that senior housing is a priority within that pipeline. Um, it's something that I know HPD works hard to do, um, given the limited constraints that they currently have, but I think in increasing that emphasis would be certainly welcomed. And I want to add that I think it would be helpful for the city to articulate when, prob when projects are not able to go through due to limitations in the federal supports that they are receiving, whether it be project-based vouchers, Section 8, whatever it may be, so that advocates are aware of to the extent that they're being hamstrung by decreased federal investment, so that we can then advocate for the federal government to increase their share, because currently we don't know how many projects are being hindered due to lack of investment from outside levels of government. Finally, um, we certainly recommend further coordination between city agencies. Within the NYCHA Next Gen program, the initial RFP included a mandate to include um, space within, community space within those buildings. So if a building was going to be 100% affordable housing for seniors, most of the time those developers thought it would be appropriate to include a senior center to meet the needs of that building. However, the timelines for when you're financing a building with HPD might not correlate to the timeline for a city procurement to get funding for a senior center, which is a challenge. We know that the city is about to re-procure the senior center system, but after FY22, when those determinations have been made, how can we continue to ensure that senior centers are brought into the pipeline, especially knowing that some senior centers have capital needs and this could be an opportunity to get new space, new equipment, new facilities. So just continuing to make sure that those agencies have the resources they need and even Department of City Planning to make sure that the buildings are looking at where can, um, where are they being positioned and is it a neighborhood with increasing senior populations that should explicitly consider including a senior center? That would certainly be welcomed. Um, finally, I just wanna add that Live on New York recognizes that NYCHA is one of the greatest affordable housing opportunities for seniors, so we appreciate Council's continued efforts to support public housing in New York City. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Peter Kempner. I'm the legal director at Volunteers of Legal Service, where I oversee our elderly project and our veterans initiative. Um, our, our elderly project does a number of things we do uh, legal clinics at senior centers and at NORCs around the city, um, as well as providing um, training and supportive services for many community-based service providers for seniors. And uh, our core work is actually to, to do advanced directives and other life planning documents for low-income seniors using our volunteer attorneys that work with us. Um, we thank the City Council's Committee on Aging and, and Housing and Buildings for holding this hearing. Um, and uh, aside from the need for advanced directives, which is our core work, the number one issue that we see from our clients is housing insecurity. Our clients are facing eviction. They have housing repair issues, rent overcharge issues, tenant harassment issues. Um, and, and so we really do applaud uh, and support uh, introduction number six. Uh, having access to counsel and having universal access to counsel is, is only as good as people being able to, to find out about this program. Um, and so I think it is critically important to put seniors on notice when they're facing eviction um, that, that, that there is potentially the availability of, of counsel to represent them in an eviction proceeding. Uh, but the council needs to recognize that there's real limitations to the universal access to council program right now. Uh, certainly, as it is being rolled out zip code by zip code, so many of the seniors that I meet just don't live in the right zip codes to be able to avail themselves of this program. And so the door is shut to them to, to be able to receive council and housing court. In addition, the 200% of the federal poverty level cap also cuts out many of the seniors we see from being able to, to get free legal services in their eviction proceedings. And you know, when you look at those numbers, a senior who makes $2,100 a month right now is over income to receive free counsel and housing court. 
You know, the many, and they do not look at whether this person is spending 50 or 70 or 80 percent of their income on their housing costs. Uh, and, and so, so many people that we see are being shut out or are unable to access this program. I'll give you an example of a subset of the elderly population um, that will be completely cut out of this program, and that is uh, elderly veterans. So if somebody is a service-connected veteran, um, and right now the youngest Vietnam-era veterans are 64 years old, and that veteran population in New York City is, is rapidly graying. And so if you are 100% service-connected disabled, you have sacrificed the most in service to this country, and you receive those benefits from the VA, you get approximately $3,100 per month. Those veterans who sacrifice the most and are facing eviction and housing court are not eligible to receive free counsel under universal access to counsel. And, and so I think that's a shame. And there's actually a solution, and that's a bill that's pending before the council. I believe it has 30 co-sponsors currently, um, introduction 1104, and that would increase um, the, the income cap for getting universal access to counsel and housing court to 400% of the federal poverty level. Um, that will bring in all of those disabled veterans to be able to make sure that they don't face eviction. It will bring in many other seniors um, who are just slightly over that $2,100 per month cap to ensure that they have access to counsel as well under the program. Uh, and, and so I, you know, that I think going hand in hand with informing seniors about their right to counsel is critically important because getting that list is only as good as being able to access the people on that list. Um, <clears throat> so, and, and, and in addition, that also will bring universal access to counsel in line with the SCREE program. The SCREE income cap is $50,000. When you look at what 400% of the federal poverty level is for an individual right now, it's $49,500 approximately. And so those two numbers are very much in line with one another. And so if we're recognizing that um, we want to preserve and keep down housing costs for people who are at or below $50,000 in income, why aren't we providing access to counsel for the same people um, in that situation? So I think that is important as well. Uh, we are also concerned about some of the enforcement aspects of this law. Um, I think there was a discussion about how, how do landlords know somebody is 60 and over. But also on the other side of things, how do we know whether or not a landlord has notified HPD that they have a senior tenant that they're bringing to housing court? There's no language in the statute that will require the landlord to put the court on notice that they put HPD, uh, that they informed HPD of a senior tenant. There will be no way uh, for the court to check whether or not the landlord has complied with the statute. Uh, and so, you know, we would recommend that there will be some sort of requirement that the landlord file proof with the court, either saying that they believe that there's nobody over the age of 62 in the household, or that they put HPD on notice and provide proof of that notice um, to the court when filing the proceeding. There's actually a very similar requirement um, under the Service Member Civil Relief Act, currently where they, they have to notify the court whether or not there's an active duty service member in the household. So landlords and landlords' attorneys are not unfamiliar with that kind of pre-process to say to the court, look, we did this preliminary step. It also happens in Section 8 proceedings, in, in proceedings against Section 8 tenants, where they have to put NYCHA on notice that they're bringing an eviction proceeding against the Section 8 tenant under the Williams Consent Decree. So this process could, could mirror what already happens with service members, with um, um, Section 8 recipients. Um, so it, it doesn't create too much of a burden on, on landlords, and it ensures compliance with the statute. Uh, lastly, I just want to, you know, we, we've spoken a lot about SCREE today. Um, and, and SCREE is, is really a linchpin program in ensuring um, that seniors have affordable housing in the city, that they're able to age in place with dignity and respect. Uh, and, and recently, the administration actually put out a set of regulations um, that, while some of them do further the purpose of the program, others actually work to undermine the program. Uh, and, and so I know that there was a recent public hearing about that, and 
many of the service providers who serve this community put in comments showing uh, you know, their concerns with the administration's regulations. And, and I just want to make sure that the council is on notice about these things and as ensuring that what the administration does uh, in, in clarifying things with SCREE also furthers the intent of the program and does not undermine it. So thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for um, allowing myself to testify on this matter. Um, my name is Suhali Mendez. I'm, I'm an advocate at, in the Disability Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, otherwise known as NELPI. Um, NELPI is a civil rights organization with a robust disability rights practice, and housing advocacy for people with disabilities is an important part of our work. NELPI represents tenants in matters involving the need for reasonable accommodations, such as apartment and common areas, retrofitting transfers to accessible apartments, and protection and use of service animals, as well as other housing discrimination issues. We appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony regarding the accessible housing in New York City. Um, so I'm going to touch more on Bill 225. Um, and we commend um, Council Member Brennan's bill in ensuring that senior citizens and people with disabilities continue to live meaningful lives within their communities. Um, excuse me. Uh, New York City housing stock is vastly inaccessible to people with disabilities. Landlords' failures to provide reasonable accommodations for their tenants, for example, providing an individual who is deaf with a smoke alarm that flashes, constitutes discrimination and impacts the resilience of our communities by causing displacement. Landlords are responsible to comply with anti-discrimination laws in New York City, and the city must enforce penalties for landlords who do not adequately address repairs or who otherwise discriminates against their tenants. The installation of protective devices will allow people with disabilities to be able to live independently without a risk to their safety. It is important to make tenants aware of this right as well as being part, um, able to request this through their landlord and management company directly without the fear of any form of discrimination or retaliation for those requests. So our organization has been around for more than 40 years and we um, advocate on behalf of New Yorkers uh, who are otherwise marginalized and we utilize a community lawyering model to bridge gaps between traditional civil rights services and civil rights advocacy in order to fortify capacity for both individual solutions and long-term impact. And we use tools of um, comprehensive organizing, policy campaigns, impact litigations, as well as individual legal services. And we're guided by the priorities of the communities that we serve, um, specifically the rights of people with disabilities and um, in, with equal access to healthcare, immigration opportunity, integrated um, local nonprofits, environmental justice for low income communities of color. And again, I thank you for the opportunity to let me speak on behalf of um, Bill 225. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, chairs, council member Chin, council member Cornegy, and the other council members present for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Stacy Biliagos, and I'm the new executive director of HANIC. HANIC is a multifaceted social service organization that has served vulnerable populations for over 45 years, touching the lives of over 35,000 individuals with a wide range of programs. Before I begin my testimony, I would like to thank Speaker Johnson and the members of the council for their steadfast support of HANIC's programs throughout the years. With our partnership, we have been able to serve thousands of individuals and families with programming such as senior centers, youth development, and workforce training. Today, I would like to speak in support of increased funding for affordable housing for our ever-growing aging population. As you know, New York City is home to more than one million adults over the age of 60. In Queens, we provide significant services for our aging population, where there is over a quarter million older adults. The need for affordable housing and related services is a critical issue the entire country is facing. The demand in New York City for sustainable, 
affordable housing continues to grow, and unfortunately, supply is extremely limited. I am happy to report, with the support of the City Council and the administration, we opened a new senior affordable housing complex, Hanek Corona Senior Gardens, in the fall of last year in Corona, Queens. It is a 68-unit housing development which includes a ground floor pre-kindergarten program and will be one of the first Passive House certified buildings in New York for older adults. Passive House buildings use up to 90% less energy for heating and cooling a residence compared to a traditional construction. The, re the residential units were quickly occupied and the community is still clamoring for more affordable housing. Overall, Hanek operates four senior housing buildings totaling over 600 units, and we have well over 45,000 seniors on our housing wait list. Hanek also operates four senior centers across Queens and overall serves over 3,500 older adults annually through various services such as congregate lunches and breakfast, exercise classes, and mental health counseling. Over the years, we have witnessed a growing need for older adult programming and housing. We at Hanek have also seen a high demand for employment. While older adults are less likely to be employed, the number of working older adults is growing dramatically. We believe this is due to a lack of retirement savings, limited government support, and overall economic inflation, especially in housing, which is driving many older adults to the workforce again. While we are here to discuss the senior housing crisis, I would be remiss if I didn't also address the need for senior employment, training, and support needed for those in the workforce. We are grateful for the City Council's leadership in taking on this issue and support that it already gives us for these services. We look forward to continuing to work closely with your committees and your colleagues on the Council to help discover new and innovative solutions to house all older adults in quality, affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony and your suggestions. And we really appreciate all the great work that all, the, all, all of you do um, in your day-to-day -day work and supporting our seniors. So we look forward to working, continue to work with you to make sure that you know, these uh, important bill legislation will be better and we'll be, you know, be able to pass them. But also some of the program that HB talked about um, that we can make it better and so that we can make sure that our senior continue to age in New York City with dignity uh, and in the neighborhood that they help to build. So I really appreciate all the, your, your great work and your suggestions for us. So I would like, I would like to uh, echo the sentiments of my uh, co-chair and just add that your advocacy and on the ground work on a daily basis with our seniors makes, makes it a, a makes us able to do uh, a relatively effective job. So without you, it, this work would be much more difficult. So I, I personally want to thank you on behalf of the seniors that I represent. Uh, we seem to be uh, aging faster than everyone else in the city in Bed-Stuy and Crown Heights. And consequently, um, are in very much need of your services and appreciate the work that you do every single day on their behalf. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. I think that's all the testimony. So thank you to my co-chair, Councilmember Cornyke. Uh, this hearing is now adjourned.